Hello, everyone, and hope that you're doing great. Now, today I'm going through this CSEC biology paper. This is a January 2024 paper, and it's a paper two. As I always remind you to do, so run through the instructions carefully and make sure you understand each instruction before you start the examination. Again, I will implore you to make sure you fill out that information sheet where you write your school number, your candidate number, your surname, and your signature. Very important stuff. All right, so let's jump into the section here at this time. Question number one. And the question reads, um, I'm going to try to go a little bit fast, so just bear with me a little bit, all right? So the question now reads that Roy and his friends visited a new roti shop in their neighborhood and purchased roti. And roti is a round flat bread made of wheat flour, um, water and oil, and chicken curry. <laughs> well, some people say curry chicken. It depends on where you come from in the Caribbean. Uh, but of course, it doesn't matter. You know, we understand the context of what they're saying right here. Whether it's curry chicken or the chicken is curry, whichever way, it doesn't matter. All right. It's a dining was not permitted on the premises, so they went to Roy's home and ate the roti and chicken curry there. For part A, it's a name two substances that are produced when each of the following foods is digested. And so for the roti that is made up of flour, oil, and it is weed flour, by, by the way. So from the flour itself, what you may get is glucose because, again, flour contains starch. All right? And the question here is to when it is digested. So I'm going to highlight that quickly so you understand why I'm saying this. All right, so let me just quickly do an highlight right here. So we're highlighting digested, when it is digested. Very important, all right? So when it's digested, um, so if flour is digested, which is a polysaccharide containing starch, we get glucose. Glucose is the end product of the digestion of starch or any um, carbohydrate. All right? From the oil in the roti, we get fatty acids and glycerol. And from the wheat part of the flour, we may get some fiber and vitamin B as well. Now, for the chicken part, because chicken is a meat, all right, or protein, then we get amino acids. And then from the chicken fat, if chicken fat are present, you know, then we may get some fatty acids and glycerol. I'm, I'm a matter of fact, uh, most of you know to cook some curry. We, cut, we normally brown the curry in the oil, you know what I mean? And so, therefore, we have oil in the curry chicken itself. Well, see, now I say curry chicken. Well, don't get mad at me. That's just my um, way of saying it. That's how I say it. Curry chicken, not chicken curry. All right? So, you know, whichever, it doesn't matter. All right. So for part B, it's a Roy is a diabetic who enjoys eating roti and chicken curry. Um, so he eats two portions daily. In table one below, part one, suggests two dietary changes that Roy should make to manage his diabetes. And for part two, it's a state one's consequence that may occur if each dietary change su suggested in B, in B1, a matter of fact, is not followed. And so I have them here. And so the dietary changes that Roy should take, one suggestion here is to reduce the amount and frequency of eating roti. That's one suggestion. And the option that I'll give to Roy is to consume more whole grains and fibrous foods. And the consequence, if he don't do this, is that the digestion of starch will increase the level of glucose in the blood. And of course, too much glucose in the blood could be critical. And we know why, because diabetics, um, they're unable to convert their, their glucose into glycogen all right, or unable to use enough glucose by the cells. All right? And of course, there's a consequence is based upon the unavailability of insulin. The second change that I would suggest right here is to intake less fat, such as the fatty portions of a chicken or any meat, a matter of fact. So he should eat mainly the lean part of the meat or bake the meat instead. Or a next option here is to consume mainly fruits and vegetables, if possible, instead of eating the meat and so on. Um, and again, high intake of fats can prevent the cells from absorbing and using glucose effectively. All right? And purpose, and a reason here, just to make mention in the blue section, is that unused glucose can remain in the blood. And of course, if too much glucose in the blood, it could be detrimental in many, many ways. So you can look at the symptoms for diabetes. 
And of course, you may see the number of things that may happen there. Now for part C, excess glucose in the blood of a healthy person can be, con can be converted to glycogen and stored. Explain why this process is not efficient in a diabetic patient or in diabetic patients. All right, so the problem now, first, the first mark, you must mention that there is a limited or no insulin produced in a person that is diabetic. And the next, to get the next point, you also must mention that the insulin, which is the hormone, is needed to convert glucose into glycogen. So if insulin is absent, then consuming glucose or have excess glucose into the blood, it could lead to many, many problems. All right. And that's the two marks right there. Mention about the, the, the purpose of insulin and the limitation of um, insulin in a diabetic patient. All right. So going to the next question. Well, next part of the question, part D. And it's still that an experiment to investigate digestion was set up as shown in figure one below and left for 15 minutes. I want you to make note of the apparatus. We have amylase solution. We have a water bath, which is at 37 degrees. And we have start solution in another test tube. All right. And then we're going down to the procedure. So the procedure outlined below was used to carry out the investigation. And the procedure include one, step one. One drop of iodine was placed into each cavity of a spotting tile, similar to the one shown in figure two below. After 15 minutes, the starch and amylase solution were mixed. And then the third step is that every two minutes, this is important here, every two minutes, one drop of mixture was placed into a different cavity of the spotting tile containing iodine as shown in figure two below. So that is the spotting tile right there. All right, so let's go to the questions now. And for part one, it suggests one reason why the starch or amylase mixture was kept in the water bath. And so it's to maintain a temperature similar to the normal body temperature. If you notice, the temperature was 37 degrees Celsius. All right, so that is very close to the normal body temperature. All right, that is the range, a matter of fact. All right, and of course, because amylase um, works in the body, so you need to maintain that temperature, close to body temperature, so amylase could be effective. All right, and so part two is a state one reason why the experiment will, um, requires the solution to be kept at the same temperature. And the reason for this is to prevent denaturing of the amylase because if you increase the temperature too high or way higher than 37 degrees Celsius, then that will break down the amylase. As we know that high temperatures will denature enzymes. And if the temperature is too low, then the enzyme will become inactive, all right? And so having blue as well is to maintain the reaction or accuracy of the results. All right. For part three, I suggest one reason why the starch and amylase solutions were not immediately mixed at the beginning of the experiment. And this was to ensure uniform temperatures throughout the solutions. Again, if you put it in the water bath, it's going to take a while for, for the entire thing to reach the same temperature. And also to ensure the enzyme is activated at optimal or optimum temperature. And of course, if you mix it too early, you may have a complete breaking down of um, the starch. All right, so that's also important. I think that one will even take... Um, precedence over these two, to be honest with you, let me put that one in, is to prevent um, the early reaction or reaction before it is um, observed. All right. And so make sure we put that right here. That one is very, very important. So to prevent, I think this one is very, very important. I know and those two I actually have to prevent reaction before observation. All right. Because if, if they mix, then they can actually cause a reaction and then you have no observation to take after that or you cannot see where it's coming from to where is that. So it's very important to not mix them before you start the experiment. 
All right. Or at the beginning of the experiment, you start. You don't start the experiment and mix those two things because, as we know, that amylase will react with the starch. All right. Let me see part four here. So just a suitable aim of the experiment. And one suggestion here is to determine the effect of time on the digestion of starch. All right. To see how fast starch will digest. All right. Uh, part five. Uh, no. Yeah, this should be part five. But anyway, let me read this instruction here. It said, the results of the experiment are shown in table two. And we have time as our first column. And time will be our independent variable. And we have observation of starch amylase mixture when placed in cavity on spotting tile. And so what happened here, we see color change. The color change will be our dependent variable. All right. Or the reaction will be our dependent variable, but time is independent based on this experiment. I want you to observe the color change as I go down the table. I will come back to them in a short while. Yeah, so part five now is that using the results in table two, determine how many minutes it took for the digestion of starch by amylase to be completed. So notice that I like the word completed. So it took 14 minutes to be completed. All right, let me go back to this and show what I'm talking about, right? Because I guess you'll see it much better by looking at the color changes. All right, so from zero time at the start of the experiment to 20 minutes, those are all the color change. Now, why do we see blue-black when we put the amylase starch mixture with the iodine? Why do we see blue-black? Because the iodine reacts with the starch and the iodine turns to blue-black, okay? That's the color of iodine to indicate that starch is present. So at the beginning of the experiment, starch was present. However, after six minutes, it starts moving from blue-black into a dark brown color, which indicates that the reaction has started. That means starch, you start, starch, starch start to break down. Then however, 14 minutes, it moves to a light orange brown color. A light orange brown, br orange brown color indicate that iodine is no longer active with starch. In other words, no starch is present. Because what we're seeing here, this orange brown color is the color of iodine. All right? Iodine is not blue-black. Iod when iodine turns to blue-black, means starch is present. So now, at this point, 14 minutes, no more starch is present. Not one bit. Because you see the true color of iodine. No starch is present. And it continues to 20, 20 minutes. Still no starch. So at time 14 minutes, the experiment was completed. So notice again the table. 14 minutes, experiment complete. At 6 minutes, however, I put this in blue for a reason. At the 6 minute, that's when the reaction started to take place. Otherwise, starch start to convert, all right? But 14 minutes is to complete. All right, so I want you to kind of understand that. Now for part six, and I hope that was clear, but if you need further explanation, I could explain that, you know, just shoot me a comment and I'll talk to you. All right, for part six, is explain your answer to D5. And the final color change is reached after 14 minutes, final color change. So no further color change after 14 minutes. And as I explained earlier, what you can also add to this, is that the um, orange-brown color indicate no more starch and indicate the true color of iodine. All right, so I could, I could just put that in for you real quick so you actually see what I'm saying. So here we're going to say that the, the orange-brown color, all right, the orange-brown color indicate no starch. Uh, no starch is present, all right? No starch is present. All right? Or the starch is fully converted. And what happened? The starch is fully converted into simple sugars, all right? Whether it be maltose, um, maltose or glucose, whichever one, all right? All right, so we're good with that. All right, so let's go down to our next question now. And this is part seven. And part seven says, state what you would expect to observe in the cavity if another drop of the mixture 
is added to the drop of iodine after 22 minutes. And after 22 minutes, it really don't matter, to be honest. Let's go to the graph, the chart, and show you. So notice from 14 to 20 minutes, same light orange brown color. So you see, you still see the same color because there's nothing to react to. There's no more starch. So iodine um, will just have its color. No color change of iodine. All right? And so after 22 minutes, light orange brown color does the same. Now for part eight, it's a list of three precautions that should be taken when setting up and carrying out the experiment. And the basic one is to reuse protective gears, um, clean up apparatus before use, and the purpose for that is to prevent contamination or unwanted reactions. Uh, my next one, you could use insulated materials such as styrofoam to maintain temperature. And this is very specific for this one because you want to maintain tem temperature um, for this experiment, but it's not always applicable for all experiments. So it depends on what you're doing. You should label your solutions as well. Especially when you're doing things with color change, you need to label so you know which solution is what and what is changing. And of course, if you use any other suitable options or suggestions, then you will get your marks, not a problem. For part nine, it said name a reagent that may be used to identify the substance or mixture remaining in the test tube after 20 minutes. And this will be Benedict's solution. Again, Benedict's is used a test for reducing sugar. Because, as you know, as we mentioned earlier, that the amylase will convert starch, which is a polysaccharide, into a simpler form, whether it be a disaccharide or a monosaccharide. So, again, you need to remember the digestion of starch. Starch is broken down into maltose first by salivary amylase. Then, further in the small intestine, it will, it will be completed by the use of pancreatic amylase into glucose. So, again, what we have is starch into maltose. All right, by salivary amylase, then maltase will break down the maltose, all right, into glucose, all right? And that is referred to as our pancreatic amylase, all right? Just to mention that. So you can just review that as well. Now we have part 10. It suggests a suitable conclusion for the experiment. And a very simple one is that amylase converts starch into simple sugar with time or over time. And then a next way it could say it as well is that at 37 degrees Celsius, amylase fully breaks down starch into simple sugars or sugar. Again, you can make your own spin, spin on this, but if you notice, the experiment was all about time. So what, whatever you mention, you need to put time in place. All right, put time, make time be a part of your conclusion because time is the independent variable. Now for part 11, is a state. If results similar to those in table one would, ex would be expected if the starch solution in the experiment is replaced by roti. And of course, yes. Yes. So the answer there is yes. Those who say yes, one mark. Now, I have, it, I have the same thing twice, te te technically. Um, so for part 12, it says suggest one reason for your answer in D11. And the reason for this is that roti is made up, of, is made up with flour are made up of flour. And again, flour contains starch. It's a starchy substance. And so once starch is used, then it, we have the similar reaction or result. The only difference is that we use a solution of starch. Roti is hard. So of course, since it's solid, the reaction will be slower, but will be similar. They did not actually be the exact same thing. Similar, yes, but maybe slower. Because of course, liquid, and powdery stuff, they tend to react faster because of um, a larger surface area for reaction compared to solid stuff. All right. Question number two. Um, A, part one. Define the term photosynthesis. And this is probably my favorite way to define photosynthesis, to be honest with you, um, because it's kind of foolproof. And this is saying that the process by which plants and plant-like organisms use light or sunlight to convert inorganic substances, which are water and carbon dioxide, to, to organic molecules, which will be simple sugars, and in this case is glucose, and along with oxygen. All right? However, if you just state that is a process by which plants make their own food, then you only get one mark for that, I guarantee you. They're not going to give you the two marks for that. So again, you need a little bit more details to earn two marks. They don't give away three marks that easily. All right, for part two, 
He said, write a balanced chemical equation for the process of photosynthesis. And please make sure that you read the question to see the difference between chemical balance equation and the road equation. All right? Sometimes people say the reaction for photosynthesis, they start right. But there's a difference between word equation and the balanced chemical equation. So as we know, it is carbon dioxide with the CO2 plus, plus water with this H2 to give you carbon um, to give you glucose with the C6H12O6 and oxygen which is O2. And six must be placed in front of everything except the glucose. So the six in blue, those are what you use to balance the chemical equation. Those indicate the number of molecules. All right. Part B is a describe the movement of water from the soil to the photosynthetic cells of the plant. And the photosynthetic cells of a plant, those are what they call the mesophyll cells. Whether it be the palisade mesophyll and the sponge mesophyll cells, those are the photosynthetic cells of the plant, particularly in the leaves. Now, the first thing that happened here, I've, uh, matter of fact, let me just state this. I have these in point formats, which is fine. Um, it's all about quality over quantity. Please remember that. So long as you have a point, especially in order, chrono chronological order, that's very important. What comes first? and the examiner could actually see, then you get the marks. It's not about the amount you write. It's about what you write. All right? So you can put them in points uh, for certain questions. All right? So you don't have to write in paragraph form for everything. Now, for question number one, it said, water molecules enter the root of your cells by osmosis. And then what happened after that is that water molecules enter the xylem vessels from the root of your cells or from the root. And then water is pulled upwards by capillary action and transpiration pull. The next thing would happen here is that water molecules reach leaves and diffuse into the photosynthetic cells and made available for photosynthesis within the chloroplast. All right. For part C, it's a distinguish between the role of intercellular space and that of the stomatal pore of the leaf in the process of photosynthesis. So looking for the role of these two structures. The intercellular space, those are within the leaf. The stomatal pore, those are on top of the leaf or on the bottom of the leaf. So they're on the surface of the leaf, okay? Now for the intercellular space is that we um, diffuses gas. So the intercellular space diffuses gas within the leaf, okay? While stomatal pore diffuses gas in and out of the leaf. Our next point is that the intercellular space, it causes diffusion and exchange of, exchange of water molecules or water vapor between the mesophyll cells. While the stomatal pore is, is responsible for releasing of water vapor into the atmosphere. So in summary, the intercellular space is the movement of substances, gases and water within the leaf and the stomatal pore is the exchange of substances, water and gases, between the leaf and the atmosphere or the environment. All right? So that's the difference right there. All right. Part D is to explain why the rate of photosynthesis decreases on a very hot day. All right. So the very first thing I mentioned here is that on a hot day, the stomata will be closed. And the reason why stomata closed is to conserve water. And of course, once the stomata are closed, then what will happen as a consequence is that no carbon dioxide can get in, or a little carbon dioxide can get in. And if carbon dioxide can't get in, then what will happen is that photosynthesis will be reduced, okay? Because the photosynthetic cells need carbon dioxide to carry out photosynthesis. And so because of this, carbon dioxide becomes limited, all right? A next point that you can have as well. So any of these you could explain. A next point is that enzymes are denatured. All right? Remember now, uh, especially when you go to the CAPE level and do photosynthesis in detail, you're going to realize that there are a number of enzymes involved in the process of photosynthesis. For now, we'll just stick to the simple version of it, right? But CAPE level, you're going to realize it's a, it's a more in-depth reaction, involves a lot of... Um, Enzymes. So photosynthetic reactions depend on enzymes to be effective. 
And remember that high temperatures denature enzymes. So if the enzymes are denatured, then it will lower the rate of photosynthesis. All right? All right. Now for part E, it's a state one role of chlorophyll in photosynthesis. And the major role, well, I could say the only role at this point is to absorb light. I know some of you will quickly say, okay, yeah, chlorophyll give color to the plant. Yes, I agree 100%. But the thing is that the color is not necessarily what is carrying out photosynthesis, right? It's the light that is needed to split water molecules. However, though, to be honest with you, the color is very important because light, white light in particular, is raw RGBiv, the seven different colors, right? And so if the plant is green because of the chlorophyll, Roy and Biv will be absorbed and green light will be reflected. So a lot of light will be absorbed versus what is being reflected, right? But the truth is, is really to absorb light, all right? That's the main function. All right, uh, part F. It's outlined two ways in which photosynthesis is important to living things. And yes, photosynthesis supply oxygen to us, very important. So we are aerobes. So any organism that are aerobes, so aerobes require oxygen to produce energy by respiration. So photosynthesis produces oxygen in exchange for carbon dioxide. That's a very important point to note. Again, you can just slow down and go through or pause and go through this, uh, these uh, notes. Um, again, Photosynthesis will help supplying food um, because photosynthesis produces food, um, which is organic energy, um, which is glucose. Um, that is very important to supply every food chain and food web on Earth. So all living things technically depend on um, photosynthesis, photosynthesis for energy or food. All right. Photosynthesis, photosynthesis is also important because photosynthesis helps to absorb and use carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, right? And of course, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, and you know what, you know what that means. So if plants don't, do not use carbon dioxide, what will happen is that carbon dioxide will stay in the atmosphere and increase the temperature of the Earth, all right? And again, you could read through the notes that I make right here. And so again, um, plant or photosynthesis help to balance the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and as a result of that, it helps to maintain favorable conditions for survival by reducing global warming and also to prevent drastic change in climate. And if you have drastic um, change in climate, then we can have extinction of organisms, migration of organisms, and the list goes on and on. So again, we need to protect our environment and we need to plant trees, recycle and all of those goodly stuff. All right, now for question number three, it said figure three below is a diagram of the carbon cycle. Complete the figure by inserting the names of the processes or substances in the numbered spaces provided. And of course, one will be carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You can just write CO2, that is acceptable, that's fine. Part two is photosynthesis. Notice the arrow is going down to the plant. And part three in the middle right there is emissions. From fossil fuel, notice there's a factory or some kind of thing burning the smoke and things. So there's some form of emission coming there. And then part four, we have respiration from the plant and animal. And one of my favorite questions to ask is when do plants respire? And trust me, believe me, some students still say that plants respire in the night. But the truth is plants respire all the time. As a matter of fact, all living things respire all the time because all cells require energy all the time so cells must keep on respiring to produce that needed energy to maintain cellular activities all right now we have part five which say decomposition notice we have death then after death then de then comes um, decomposition and then we have um, part six we have death and also waste products all right, such as, of course, um, urea, feces, and all of those things that contain organic materials that nat naturally contains um, carbon. All right, so part two is a state one reason why carbon is important to living things, and carbon is important for so many different reasons. But the basic reason is 
carbon make up all living molecule. All living things are made up of carbon because all living things are organic in nature. So I just have here to produce organic molecules such as glucose, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and the list goes on and on. So you can just say, I have glucose as an, as an example, but you can just put carbohydrates, all right? And, and, and you know that. All right, proteins, lipids, lipids which includes fats and oils. Um, carbon is needed to make DNA and RNA. So almost every living thing or almost every biomolecule, as we call them, or molecules that are needed for, to sustain life, they are made up of carbon, most of them, except water, of course. But besides that, most other substances made up of carbon or contains carbon. All right, uh, part B. Define the following terms as they relate to the preservation and conservation of the environment. And we have reuse. That one is straightforward, reusing something. So this one is to make useful over and over again, especially for its intended purpose. And in blue, a very summary version to make useful again. And reduce, reduce, is really to use less of. So it is to limit the amount of times the material or substance is being used. And in blue, it's a decreasing the amount of times the material is being used, especially to prevent wastage. All right, and recycle. Um, let us go back to reduce again. Um, you know, especially like you have a car and a car will use fossil fuel. So if you reduce the amount of times you drive the car, you know what I mean? Then you burn less fossil fuel and then you kind of prolong the amount of emission in the atmosphere. And so you're also prolong damages to the environment or prevent the damages to the environment. So reduce could be in many forms. Reduce of the electric, um, electric current, you know, don't waste electric current, things like that. Conserve, conserve electricity. Um, water, use of water. Reduce the amount of water you use to do certain things, yeah? I mean, but bathing, you should always bathe. So, but, of course, you can be strategic in how you bathe as well, you know, but, yeah, to conserve water. Recycle. Recycle is to make useful in another way after it was used for its intended purpose. And in blue is to convert into something new after it has been used, all right? For part C, is a daisy the latest this assembly robot from Apple is able to recover aluminum, gold, silver, copper, and other metals from iPod devices. Well, I say iPod, iPhone devices. Um, here's the suggest two advantages of recycling metals from iPhones. And um, to recycle uh, the metals, there are a number of different things. I mean, you can list some others that I don't have. Um, it's a less built up of waste materials into dump site because you're going to dump the phone if it's not usable anymore. And so we have less pollution if we do that. Um, less mining of metals to make new parts. So you can use the old parts, you know. And so we conserve natural resources uh, to reduce price for acquiring new materials or metals. And so if you reduce price for these things, then there's a possible chance to improve the economy and also less toxic waste. Because, of course, production normally releases toxic waste. And also dumping um, the phone himself um, because of a chemical um, may seep into the earth and cause um, poison. So less toxic waste or leach, leaching of these um, substances in the earth may take place. And so this helps to protect the environment or reduce global warming. So there are a number of things you can talk about here. All right. Uh, part two. is a complicated table. Uh, table three below by explaining two ways in which the recycling of cell phones differ from the recycling of leftover food. All right. And so we have the recycling on the left and um, recycling of cell phones on the left and recycling of leftover food on the right. And so, again, um, for certain things, though, you have, to be, you have to explain them to be correct because certain things by themselves may not be too, too correct. I'm going to tell you that. So be careful. And again, you're not limited to the answers that I have. But these are just some suggestions or possible ways that they're, that they're different or differ. And so, for one, um, recycling of cell phones may be faster because you can just pull the parts and just reuse them if that's the case. And so, some parts can be used directly or with little processing. Uh, so, that makes it faster. But you're going to recycle leftover food for to decomp because leftover food, or you reuse leftover food, it's not by eating them again, yeah? Or not. <laughs> 
But you use leftover food into using making compost and things like that. You know, you have to decompose them. So it normally takes a longer time or slower. And so you need time for decomposition, especially if it is used in compost, right? It's not an overnight thing, all right? And the second one is that um, recycling of cell phones may require more energy. That is, if, if processing is required. So if you're going to process, re, um, like say, example, you're going to melt the metals and use them to make something else or to remove certain parts and to convert them to something else, then absolutely um, it will take a lot of energy, all right? And probably give off some waste as well. But to recycle leftover food requires less energy. You just have a compost heap, for example, pile up everything in it, mix it sometimes, and the thing will decay naturally by its own. And then, as well, for recycling cell phones, what you normally get is inorganic products, and recycling of left leftover food, it normally result in organic products. So that's another one, too, as well. All right, for part D, is I suggest two ways in which the recycling of a tree after it's cut down can, can be beneficial to a community. And there are so many ways that you can talk about here. So one of them is to provide jobs. Uh, it provides jobs. It reduces waste and habitat for pests. So because if you have the trees there, laying down in the environment without recycling them, then certain pests may be arbor, you know, or, or becomes uh, be a suitable habitat for, for them, which you don't want, like rats or any other thing, you know. Certain bugs really can be lay, lying around under the dead trees. Um, provide useful materials. So you can recycle the trees to make useful materials, such as uh, probably a bench or something, something useful, maybe some wooden spoons or something, right? Um, you can also reduce cost for raw materials to recycle for certain things. You can use um, the, the tree for certain things. Um, for biofuel, too, you can even use a tree for biofuel. Come, come to think about it. You can use it for mulching. You could use it um, as manure, as compost, so many different things. Um, and the recycling process also could bring community members together. So it could also build social um, standing of the community. You know, people are more together, more friendly. They get to learn about each, each other as well. And it can build a really community bond in that sense. Um, so that's on a social level. And any other suitable options, I, I'm sure they will give it a mark for, for those. These are some suggestions. All right. So some of the things are not limited as well. Number four, this is section B. Um, and here now is I define the term transpiration. And transpiration is the process by which water is being lost from the uppermost part of the plants, usually the leaves. Um, and this is done by evaporation. And so in a very simpler way to say it for one mark is the loss of water from plants by evaporation. All right? So anything with that in, along that line, you should be all right. Part B is a state two reasons why transpiration is important to plants. And the two main reasons, number one, is to cool the plant down. Well, that's not, num well, main reason for real because water transpire because of too high temperatures or if water gets too hot in the leaves, they will escape the leaf by evaporation. So yes, it'll have to cool the plant down, and how it does this is because the cooler water will replace the warmer water in the leaf. So cooler water coming from the earth through, uh, through, the, through, through the xylem vessels will replace the warmer water in the leaves. And the second one is to make water available in the leaves for photosynthesis. And again, while water is being removed by transpiration, water is being pulled upwards from the soil into the leaves. And so that water become, uh, becomes available for photosynthesis to take place. All right, so those are the two main reasons right there. Part C is a list three factors other than temperature which may affect the rate of transpiration. And so wind speed, humidity, and light intensity, those are the other three that will affect the rate of transpiration. Now, please, let me tell you this. You see, if they have asked you to name three other factors that can increase the rate of transpiration, that's a different story. Because you can't just say wind speed, humidity, and light intensity. You have to say how. For example, if you say what could cause an increase within transpiration, you say, okay, higher wind speed, lower humidity, higher light intensity. So you have to be careful with the question that they ask you, okay? So please, 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 please read the questions carefully, all right? Now for part D, is that for each of the three factors listed in C, explain how it affects the rate of transpiration. 
And so here I have wind speed. All right? And so they are asking to be very specific, right? And of course, you know, this will be vice versa. All right, so wind speed, generally, higher wind speed increases the rate of transpiration, all right? That's not the word transpiration there. It's a misspelled word. Let me change that real quick. Transpiration. All right, come on, come on. All right, just a second, just a second. I want to get this word. All right, all right. can't get my cursor into it for some reason. Oh, now I have to go back. I think I made a mistake. All right, I think... All right, I think I could just write it back um, because higher wind speed will actually increase the rate of um, transpiration, all right, or evaporation. I, I just delete by some mistake. I don't even know how to get it back. All right, but that's fine. All right, so please just make a note of that. Again, as I'm saying that higher wind speed will increase the rate of transpiration. So please make a note of that. All right, and so more water vapor is removed away from the leaves because of higher wind. And this allows for easy diffusion of water vapor into the atmosphere. All right, so that is gone. All right, I'm not going to waste time to write it back. Just please remember that. Higher wind speed result in higher transpiration. Lower wind speed will definitely result in lower transpiration. All right? Now, humidity. Oh, boy. I think. All right, cool. Humidity. I know I get that one change. All right, so for hum humidity... Here we have, it said, higher humidity decreases the rate of transpiration. And so for higher humidity, um, what is happening here? Uh, I'm missing some letters here. I think this thing is, the, okay. I think, no, it's not the computer. I thought it was it, computer, but it's me. All right, cool. All right, so higher humidity decreases the rate of transpiration. And so for higher humidity, more water is being, more water is in the atmosphere. Just to make mention of that. And since a lot of water is in the atmosphere because of higher humidity, then this makes it difficult for water to be evaporated or diffused into the atmosphere. All right? And of course, this is vice versa. Lower, if the lower the humidity is, is the higher the rate of transpiration. All right. For light intensity now, if light intensity increases, then the potential of transpiration also increases. The reason for this is because light stimulates the opening of stomata. So if you have more light and the stomata are open really wide, then there's a higher chance for water to be evaporated or escape the leaf. All right? All right, so that covers the three of those. All right, so we are down to the next part of the question right here. Um, part E, it said, explain one way in which climate change can negatively impact the agriculture sector in the Caribbean. All right. And so there are, many re there are many options here, right? Many, 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 many options here. But these are just some, again, suggestions. Um, they say, explain one, and as I give you uh, four, and there are more than four, to be honest, right? So we have poor growth, and poor growth could be as a result of lack of rain, which we call drought over a long period of time. Lack of rain over a long period of time is resulting in a drought. And this will reduce uh, food photosynthesis. You have reduced food photosynthesis because of lack of water. Um, wilting could take place as well. So you don't have enough leaves or healthy leaves to carry out photosynthesis. We have an increased transpiration again because, again, lack of water and the heat is high. Then transpiration, you lose too much water from the plants. The plants are not healthy enough to carry out photosynthesis, so the plant won't grow. Um, flooding or erosion may take place in some places because of the ice cap melting. It could cause a rise in sea levels and, and also flooding, flooding by rivers as well may take place. And if lands are flooded uh, or land has been washed away because of high, high level of sea or river flooding, then we may not have enough land to plant crops or rear animals. All right? And so... You may also have reduced vegetation um, because of dying trees, and that lead to erosion as well. Um, so, so areas that normally good for farming may no longer be available, especially those plain lands or flat lands um, that most farmers like for certain things. Then those lands may not become available anymore. We also may have reduced production, and some crops are seasonal. And stimulated by weather, so some crops only will bear fruit in a certain time under certain weather conditions. 
And so you may have a reduced production in, in those crops. Also, because of extreme weather or climate change, then what may happen as well is that you may have migration of pollinators or even migration of certain organisms. So you have decreasing biodiversity. And when, for example, bees um, migrate or pollinators migrate in general, then you have some plants aren't able to produce um, viable seeds or even develop, develop into proper fruits. All right, you may have also deplete soil um, because extreme heat may burn the soil and destroy the nutrients in the soil. Especially, they may also destroy nitrogen-fixing bacteria that is important to convert the nitrogen gas in the atmosphere into nitrates to make them available to um, plants. So there are a number of things can happen here, as I'm saying that, you know, but again, you can just go um, look through the notes and see what makes sense to you and what you understand and also add your spin to it as well. There's not a problem, you know. Just make sure you understand the context really well. All right, for part two, is I suggest one way in which countries can reduce or slow down the occurrence of climate change. And there are many ways that you can mention here. So one of the things is to reduce Pollution, that is a major way. And it can list any form of pollution. So it can listen in any, any examples or explain any examples. And so to reduce the use of fossil fuel, for example, you can, you can talk about waste management or include waste management te techniques, such as solid waste, recycling, and all of those stuff. You can talk about reduce the use of CFCs, encourage planting of trees, invest in renewable energies, such as solar energy, hydropower, wind energy, biofuels. So you can talk about so many things right here. You can trust me, you can run out on this one. All right. So again, just to make sure you're familiar with the notes and apply them really well. Now for part five or question number five, is to define each of the following terms. Gene. And a gene is a segment of a DNA that controls a specific characteristic or trait of an organism. And a matter of fact, you can uh, just make a note. This piece in blue is a notation. Genes are responsible to transmit characteristics from parents to offspring. All right, so that's just a thing that you need to know. All right. Now, allele. An allele is a variant form, which is different forms of a gene controlling the same trait. All right. And point to note is that an allele, an allele can be dominant or recessive. And again, this bit of information that I asterisk is just for your own knowledge. So if the allele is dominant, then we represent that with an uppercase letter. And if the allele is recessive, we represent that with a lowercase letter. All right. And again, um, we know this based on how they are expressed. So the dominant trait will always express itself. The recessive trait can only express itself only when they have two recessive alleles. All right. All right. Chromosomes. Now, chromosomes are thread-like structures found in the nucleus of cells that carry genetic information from one cell to another cell. All right? And a point to note, um, for diploid cells, um, chromosomes are in pairs. All right? Chromosomes are in pairs. And a point to note as well that chromosomes are made of DNA. And have a look at a small thing on the side right there to the left. That genes make up DNA, while DNA make up what? Chromosomes. You need to know that as well. All right? So please just review that. Slow it down or pause and write them down. For part B, it's that figure four shows the process of meiosis. In the figure, two homologous pairs of chromosomes are shown in the original cell. All right? So it's a two homologous pairs of chromosomes are shown in the original cell. All right, so we have four chromosomes in total. All right, um, to be honest, I don't like the way they label this diagram. I'm going to tell you why. And that's why you have some arrows in green at the side. Because the axe here, with reference to the figure four, describe the events occurring at the areas marked A, B, and C. All right, but I know what they want based on what they're saying here because they're asking for the events at the areas. And so, re remember when we talk about meios uh, meiosis, so meiosis here, hold on, let me see something. All right, so meiosis, we have two set of divisions. We have meiosis one and meiosis two, okay? And so, I'll make sure you understand this, that coming from the original cell, 
to reach a disk cell, you must have the interphase. The interphase replicates the DNA, and that's why now you have each chromosome with two chromatids each, right? So that's after the interphase. However, for all of this cell to convert to these cells, they must go through meiosis 1. But personally, I like to label this on the arrow because this will, this will indicate a specific phase within meiosis 1. So if you put a phase, then you have to explain the, what is occurring in the phase that they ask down below. But this will be a stage of, of meiosis. I'm going to tell you, because truthfully, cell A is not proper for any of the phases. Because if you look at it, if you look at the prophase, for example, in meiosis 1, the chromosomes supposed to overlap, showing you the tetrads, all right? Showing you the exchange of the genetic materials, which is crossing over. But they're not showing that. So this already passed the crossing over stage because the chromosomes are just there in the cell. And however, after the prophase, it will go to the metaphase. So they should be side by side, side by side in the middle of the cell, like on the metaphase plate, but side by side in pairs. That's not seen here as well. In the anaphase, they should be going on the sides. And in the telophase, you should, you should see cleavage furrow. So none of the phases of meiosis one actually shown here. But the whole thing summarizes meiosis one. But I prefer to leave it on the arrow rather than labeling at the side of the cell. But I expect, I, I kind of suspect what they want. So, you know, that's just my explanation for it. And so if you're confused in terms of the phase versus the stage, then I do understand because I don't like the diagram, to be honest. But I figure out what they want based on what they ask at the bottom. Now for B, this is meiosis 2. Again, notice where I put it, where the green arrow is pointing. That's where I'll put meiosis 2, to be honest with you. Um, because I, I will accept now that, that B could have been the metaphase 2. Okay, So I will accept that B be metaphase 2 for the fact that they line up in the middle of the cell in single file. So that occur in metaphase in metaphase two, okay. But I just saying this is meiosis two because I will accept this as meiosis one, all right. And um, C will be the cyto cytokinesis, and these are actually what they call daughter cells, uh, or what they call the gametes, because meiosis only produce gametes, okay. All right. So it's a with reference to, to figure four, you know, describe the events occurring at the areas marked A, B, and C. And as I explained why I put meiosis one, meiosis two, and cytokinesis, because of how the diagram is being outlined. All right. And so in meiosis one, there's a number of things happening, happening from, we can talk about from the prophase all the way through the telophase. And we have synapses and crossing over take place. We have exchange of genetic materials occur. All right, and you have formation of tetrads. You have homologous chromosome moved to the opposite side of the poles. We have um, reduction in number of chromosomes. So you have less chromosomes than what you actually started out with in each cell. That's occurring in meiosis, uh, meiosis 1. All right, and um, just to make a note that synapsis and crossing over is very important to bring about diversity in sexual reproducing organisms. Now, meiosis 2. Chromosomes align, align in single file along the metaphase plate. Sister chromatids separate to opposite poles. Cleavage furrow forms. Nuclear membranes reform. All right, and that's occurring in meiosis 2. And meiosis 2 is just like mitosis. So I have some lessons on these, so you can actually jump onto them. As a matter of fact, I have lessons on a lot of different things that are actually mentioned in this um, paper. So you can check out those individual lessons if you desire to do so. Now, cytokinesis, and cytokinesis, this is where the cytoplasm of each cell splits into two new daughter cells. All right, and that's the final stage of the entire division process right there. Now, for part C, it says suggests one consequence that may occur if meiosis does not occur as illustrated in figure four. So if meiosis is not completed or take place according to what is shown, then what they can have is too many chromosomes in one cell. Because, of, again, if it's not totally split, um, you have a lot of chromosomes in one cell. 
Also, you may have a possibility of more than one nucleus, well, let's say nuclei, more than one nuclei in a cell. Mutation is possible as well to take place. You have no viable gametes being produced. Gametes may produce, but they're not viable because the, 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 the nucleus may have different number of chromosomes will not be recognized by an egg cell, for example. So the sperm cell may not be able to recognize the this egg cell may not be able to recognize the sperm cell or they cannot combine effectively. Right? Because of the absence of the enzymes, a lot of things could happen there if my if meiosis is not occurring properly. Now for part D, so meiosis is important because it causes genetic variation. So just one reason why genetic variation is important to speciation. Now, in terms of speciation, we're talking about specific species and the differences among species. And so here, an important reason that it increases the potential of survival under different environmental pressures. What do I mean by this? If the environment is changing or something in the environment that can affect an, an organism because of differences within that species, what could happen is that one may be favored over the other. Okay? So the, in other words, you should, you should notice, I think, some of you might know it or remember it, the fittest of the fittest will survive. And so the one with the better trait will survive that environmental pressure. Let's say, for example, you have two organisms, one black, one, one white, but they live in a dark area or a dark hoodie area or a dark forest. The white one will be easily, easily eaten by predators compared to the darker ones. So even though they're the same type of organism, but because of that difference in color, one is more easily spotted by predators, and so they will become extinct easier. And so in blue, as in mentioned here, that better adaptation to prevent extinction. All right, so that's the purpose for diversity or variation among species. All right, for part E, and we get in there, is that the height of pea plant is controlled by a single gene which has two alleles. A tall, um, purebred pea plant is crossed with another, with another, which is, I think, I like this for a reason, with another um, pea plant, and all of the offspring have the same phenotype with the use of genetic diagrams, state the phenotype of the offspring. Now, purebred means that it must be the same alleles, okay? I have some, yeah, I have it at the bottom right here. Cool, I'm going to mention it. So first thing I say, define the alleles. Define the alleles. So the alleles are the same for the purebred, and they are, and they are the version of the gene that controls the trait for height. So the allele I have in red here, we can say T is for tall, and small, well, uppercase T for tall, because we suspect it to be dominant based on this. And lowercase is for short, and it's mean recessive in this case, all right? So tall is dominant, short is recessive, all right? And again, you use uppercase T and lowercase T for short. So the parent's phenotype is always stated one here. It said one is purebred, right? One is a tall purebred. So the word tall is a phenotype. So the purebred is tall, and the other one could be tall or short. Doesn't matter. Because they say another pea plant right here, and the pea plant gives the same phenotype. I'm going to show you why any of these will be correct. Whether it be tall or short, it doesn't matter. All right? Um, so the poor bread is tall, always tall. If it's a different plant, they, ne they never state that the other plant is poor bread. They said um, a poor bread pea plant is crossed with another pea plant. And I say another poor bread plant, another pea plant, which is any pea plant. All right? It's a parent. Um, Genotype, we actually state them right here now. So the tall one has to be the two uppercase T's. That's the genotype right here, combination of the alleles. And for the other one, it could be two uppercase T's, upper and a lowercase T, or a two lowercase T's. And I put the, the uppercase and lowercase, which is the hybrid that I'm going to use in blue. So purebred is always homozygous, so to make mention of that. So once you use the word purebred, it means that must be the same allele, homozygous form. The hybrid is always, the word hybrid means heterozygous. The word hybrid is not presented here, but just in case you see a next question, I talk about hybrid. Hybrid means heterozygous. So if I'm going to use a heterozygous and a purebred, 
my result will be this. Again, it doesn't matter what they use with the homozygous dominant. Once the purebred is homozygous dominant, the other plant doesn't matter. The phenotype will always be the same. Just remember that. So anything you cross with a homozygous dominant genotype, the result will have the same. All of the offspring must have the same phenotype. Guarantee you. And you can try it and you can try it and you will see. The difference now would be the genotype. Okay? The difference can be the genotype. But once you talk about phenotype, once you use a homozygous dominant parent or genotype, the offsprings must all have the same phenotype. All right, last question. It said the human skin is responsible for temperature regulation. State one other function of the human skin. Besides regulating temperature, it also protects us from microbes. It protects us from UV light and physical damages. It also helps in production of vitamin D. It also helps to sense um, a sensation in terms of sensing touch, pain, pressure, temperature. It also helps to reduce dehydration. So any of those, you'll be good. Now, part B said John took his temperature, his temperature in the morning and it was normal. At midday, while gardening, he took his temperature again, right? And it was also normal. John is surprised that his temperature remained normal despite being in the sun all afternoon. Explain two ways in which two different structures in John's skin functioned to regulate his body temperature while he was gardening. So there are three structures that play a role in maintaining temperature. One is blood capillaries. The blood capillaries, because he's gardening, now we're talking about, let's just make, make sure I mention this. If he's gardening and in the sun, that means the mechanism should reduce his body temperature, right? So I'm answering only to release heat from, from the body. The opposite of this will gain heat if you're in cold. So the capillaries now dilate. And this is because in the sun, if it was in a cold place, the capillaries, the capillaries will constrict. All right, so the dilation of the capillary is called vasodilation. The opposite, of, the opposite of this is called vasoconstriction. That's when you're in cold places or when you're cold. When the capillaries dilate, they release excess heat to the environment. And so as a result, the temperature of, of, of his body, John's body, will drop to normal. Okay? Now, sweat glands in John's body, um, so the sweat glands... Uh, Da, 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 da. One mistake here. So the sweat glands in John's body. Okay. Ay, ay, ay. All right. Mercy. All right. Sometimes, all right, I don't know what's happening, but every time I do this, it, it delete. But anyway, let us read what was there, and I can't go back. All right, for some reason. All right, so a point to note right here, right, that the sweat glands in John's body will produce sweat, right? And when the sweat evaporates, the heat is taken away from this from the body. So the so the, the reading should have been the sweat glands when it's in the, the sun or when the temperature increases, the sweat gland the sweat glands produce produce sweat, and when the sweat evaporates, um, heat is taken away from the body. Now the hairs on his skin and hairs on, on his skin lay flat or lie flat to prevent air being trapped above the skin. And this results in heat being lost to the environment. All right? And um, a point to note right here is that hair lay flat when erector muscle relax. And, of course, the opposite is true when it's not straight, when you're cold. And that's why you have goosebumps. All right? So I hope you catch that piece that was um, deleted um, before, you know. Um, so let's go to part C. And this is say Jan. And if you're Spanish, they say An. So it depends on if you're English or Spanish. Well, you know, if you're Spanish speaking, you're going to say Han, right? An. So let's, let's say Jan in English for, for now, um, whatever the name is. All right, so, so Jan is Caucasian, right? And her husband, Anthony, is African-American. They recently returned from a vacation in the Caribbean. While they both applied sunscreen daily, Jan was a bit more cautious and unlike her husband, frequently reapplied her sunscreen during the day. Explain one reason why John needed to be more cautious than her husband and why she frequently reapplied her sunscreen. 
And the reason here is that because John lacks the pigment melanin. So that's the main reason. All right. And the, and the explanation behind that is that melanin, uh, melanin, melanin absorbs UV, which is ultraviolet rays, and protect the skin from damage. All right. And so since she lacks the melanin, then she has to apply more sunscreen to protect her skin from being damaged by the UV rays. All right. So anyway, down that line, you should be good or you will be good. All right. So anyway, that line, you should be okay. All right. Uh, let's go to part D. It's a defined term, homeostasis. And homeostasis is to maintain the internal conditions of the body. Um, part D, part two, it said the kidneys is responsible for maintaining homeostasis, described with reference to a named hormone, how the kidneys achieve homeostasis on a hot day. And on a hot day, more antidiuretic hormone, which is AD ADH, is being produced due to ADH, which is antidiuretic hormone, more water is being reabsorbed by the kidneys because ADH is responsible to reabsorb water, all right, or to conserve water in the body. And so more water is stored in the collecting ducts of the kidneys, all right? So less urination takes place, and, and the reason why you urinate less because more water is available for possible sweating to cool the body down, all right? And point to note is that homeostasis is achieved because less water is lost by urination to compensate for the water lost by sweating. All right, so that's very important. And just a point to note right here to um, the persons who drink alcohol, I think that wasn't a question some point, some time ago, I don't remember. But um, effect of alcohol and ADH. The more alcohol you drink, it, it, it inhibits your ADH. And that's why um, you cannot conserve water. And that's why persons who drink alcohol, especially drinking beers, will urinate so often. All right? And a point to note is that when you control water in the body, it is called osmoregulation. So this just explains the process of osmoregulation. Now, part E is that James has had hypertension for the last 10 years. Recently, he developed kidney failure. One suggests two consequences of that James could experience due to his kidney failure. And one is the buildup of fuels, um, fluids. Sorry, I said fuels, but fluids. All right. And so the why you build up um, fluids is simply because you have ineffective osmoregulation taking place because the kidney fail and you have too much water in the blood or too much water in the body cells or the cells of the body. All right. And next thing could happen is that they have a built up of waste products because the kidney is responsible to remove waste from the body. And so because you have, if you have a reduced level of excretion, then definitely going to have a lot of waste. And so you have the inability to remove waste products from the body. And so if you build up waste, it can also poison the body as well. You also have, have a built up of electrolyte because electrolytes, um, they come from salt. And so if you have a retention of salt because the kidneys also remove salt from the body, you can have a built up of electrolyte. And if you have a built up of electrolyte, then it may cause things like headache, nausea, nervous problems, and many, 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 many more other um, problems as well may develop. Um, last part of the question right here is to suggest one way in which James could have avoided developing kidney failure. And one is to reduce salt intake. One is to eat more fruits and vegetables, reduce high-protein foods, because high-protein will really, will, uh, proteins will form amino acids, and then urea come from excess amino acids. And the kidneys respond to take out, take out urea of the body. And so you reduce the intake of proteins. Exercise more frequently as well. And eat less fatty foods and things like that. Those are very important things. All right. And so at this point, we're at the very end of this review. It was fun having you. And it was fun going through. So again, please, if you have not yet, haven't done so yet, please subscribe and share with your friends. And I wish you good luck from now on the examination. So take care. And I'll talk to you soon. All right.